Welcome back, everyone. Um, this afternoon, we'll hear from uh, our final batch of presenters on California's use of incentives in the criminal legal system we began to talk about earlier this morning. Then we'll move on to talk about proposals for the topics to, that we heard about today and hear from staff about issues considered in earlier meetings. Uh, and then we'll finish with public comment. So um, this panel, as I mentioned, is about the use of incentives in the criminal legal system in California. Um, and our panelists are, I apologize for surely mispronouncing your name, Orley Aus, is that, is that even close? Orley Aus, it was close enough. Orley Aus. Thank Oose. you. Thank you. Um, from the Department of Criminology, University of Pennsylvania, Mia Bird, who's assistant research professor at UC Berkeley Goldman School of Public Policy, and one of our colleagues from the uh, California Policy Lab, and Professor David Ball from Santa Clara uh, University School of Law. Thank you all for joining us. Professor Oos, who's joining us from France, um, begin with you. Oh, and I should have said, uh, which I said in the morning, we've read uh, anything that you may have submitted to us, and we really hope that you can spend um, just five minutes getting us through the highlights, and we really, um, I think, get the most progress done and the most during a Q&A session after that. So with that said, Sounds uh, good. let's start with the five-minute presentation. Great. Uh, so I'm going to summarize work uh, that was published in the Journal of Public Economics called Misaligned Incentives and the Scale of Incarceration in the United States, where I focus on a policy that was at, adopted in California. Um, so this paper explores whether the fact that the criminal justice uh, does not have any fiscal breaks influences sentencing decisions. And what I mean by that is that um, arrests, prosecution, and sentencing are all at the municipal or county level, whereas corrections, uh, uh, prisons are paid for at the state level. So as a result, those choosing punishments don't pay for it. Of course, there are trade-offs between fiscal equalization um, meaning you don't want poor counties not to be able to afford the public safety measures they need, and uh, a common resources problem where if you don't pay for something, then you may overuse it. Um, so in this project, we ask how cost externalization affects both incarceration and offending. Um, and to do so, we focus, I focused on the 1996 California Juvenile Justice Realignment, whereby the costs of juvenile incarceration were shifted from, um, uh, from the state to counties. So overall, the costs stay the same, and there were no other changes in juvenile justice organization. So this enables me, uh, by comparing cases that happens to be sentenced just before and after this policy was adopted, and also looking at uh, juvenile arrests around these dates, to understand how cost internalization or counties bearing the costs of juvenile incarceration affected both juvenile incarceration and recidivism. Um, so this first figure here shows what happens to juvenile admissions um, uh, per month just before and after the policy was adopted. And you can see a clear de uh, decrease in uh, admissions to state prisons for juveniles. Um, for two counties, uh, Santa Clara and Orange County, I'm able to get more fine-grained data. And so in these counties, at least, I find no substitution to local juvenile facilities. Instead, there seems to be an increase in dismissal and diversions. Um, so the follow-up question is to know whether this came at any costs in terms of public safety. And to do so, I looked at juvenile arrests. And you can see that there wasn't any change in juvenile arrests either overall, or this is just one example, uh, in violent uh, crimes either. Um, so takeaways is that when prison costs are internalized, uh, less punitive alternatives are, are then explored. And in addition, an extra incarceration did not buy less offending. So there was socially wasteful um, uses of incarceration when costs weren't fully internalized. And so opening up to uh, questions, which I'm happy to talk about in the Q&A, uh, one question is, do you need to internalize these costs or would information suffice? So do you want to make cost differentials more salient? Do you want to include cost benefit analyses when uh, mentioning sentence or provide judge feedback on case outcomes? And then I do want to raise the normative question that you know, this paper is really about thinking about the trade-off between punishment and public safety, but of course there are other uh, reasons for criminal punishment to be around. All right, so I'm gonna stop here and look forward to the Q&A. That was, that was perfect and very interesting. Thank you very much. 
Um, Mia? All right. So I'm just going to take a few minutes to summarize some of the findings on the impacts of SB 78 and public safety realignment and really kind of categorizing them together as policies that aligned county incentives with state goals. So the call for reform really was based around kind of this peak prison population of 173,000 people in 2006 following decades of growth in that prison population which kind of left the state in a difficult situation where prisons were overcrowded, correctional costs were really high, and return to prison rates weren't very good. They were pretty high as well. And the LAO had estimated around this, just before the passage of SB 678 that about 40% of new prison admissions were the result of probation revocations. And we also had an emerging evidence-based practices literature that was increasingly demonstrating that if we could target interventions at criminogenic risks and needs, we could improve recidivism outcomes. So all this was happening at the time that SB 678 was passed. And the strategy here was really to align county incentives around revoking individuals from probation into prison with that state goal of reducing prison revocations and ultimately the prison population. And so the way that we did that was the state told counties that they would receive a portion of the state, any state savings from a reduction in revocations, kind of starting from a pre-SB 678 baseline, and that these extra funds for probation should really be used to fund evidence-based practices, kind of closing the loop on the theoretical mechanism for how we might be able to improve public safety. And what we saw as a result is that it, just in that first year, we saw a 23% reduction in revocations to prison. And that resulted in a savings of about 179 million for the state, of which a portion was allocated to the counties. And we also see evidence of an increase in the use of EBPs by county probation departments. So here you can see the decline in revocations in those two years from 7.9% to 5.5% or about a 30% decline over the first two years. And really that period is the one we draw on to understand the effects of SB 678 because soon after we had realignment and then a number of other reforms that affected revocations to prison and affected overall incarceration rates. So realignment is somewhat similar to SB 678 really driven by that um, high level of prison incarceration and trying to reduce incarceration at the state level. And doing that by align aligning those county incentives with that state goal of reducing the prison population by shifting the responsibility for the management of people convicted of lower level felony offenses from the state to the counties. And also providing counties with funding to implement additional evidence-based practices and to kind of adapt to that new responsibility in the way that made the most sense for the county. And as a result, we saw a big reduction in prison incarceration by more than 25,000 people just in that first year. And although jail populations did increase somewhat under realignment, which was expected, overall, the total state incarceration rate declined substantially. And we see evidence of an increase in the use of evidence-based practices. When we look at recidivism, we see some mixed effects. We see some small increases for some of the populations affected by realignment and some small decreases for other populations. When we look at crime rates following SB 678 and realignment, and here you have a pretty wide picture of historical crime rates, but we're thinking about this period following 2009 and 2011, we see, you know, under SB 678, we see crime rates decline in both years following that change in policy. And under realignment, we see violent crime rates pretty stable, but some increase in property crime rates. And we're particularly seeing increases in auto theft rates right after realignment. So just to sum up findings, we see SB 678 and realignment led to reductions in prison incarceration and an increased use of evidence-based practices. We see reductions in crime rates following SB 678. We see some mixed effects on crime following realignment. But overall, we see policies that incentivized and supported counties to focus on improvement from a baseline toward state goals. And I just have some references here for you in the slides, which will be posted, and my contact information if anyone has questions or comments following today. Thank you very much. That was super helpful. Uh, David? 
Hi, uh, thanks, uh, Chairman Romano. So the United States incarcerates more people than any other society at any point in human history. So either we're the only ones who get it got it right out of everyone who ever lived, or we're doing something wrong. And in saying that, I don't deny that there are some very real problems with public safety. Though I wanna make sure that when we talk about public safety, we're talking about all the things that make people unsafe. So not just crime, but also hunger or housing instability or childhood poverty or an environmental contamination and also harms from the criminal legal itself, among many other threats to public safety. And there are questions that I usually ask my students when they propose policies that I wanna ask about our current system, right? So what problem do we think that mass incarceration solves? What's our theory behind why the problem occurs? How does mass incarceration address that problem via the theory? And how will we know if it works? Like what data will give prove the policy's success or failure? So if the problem is crime, do we think prison solves that problem? And if so, why? So if you look at the history of the past 50 years, when crime goes up, we need more prisons. When crime goes down, prisons are working. But that's not the only way to read the trends. It would be equally valid to say when crime goes up, prisons aren't working. And when crime goes down, we don't need prisons. So the numbers need interpretation. We need to have a theory of why, since multiple theories explain the data. We need to figure out which theory is most credible. Again, given that we are historic outlaw liars, I think we need to prove that mass incarceration works. And even if we define public safety as crime alone, we have a choice about how to deal with public safety problems. We don't start with, given that we have to use incarceration, what do we do? We don't have to use incarceration. And in fact, as I demonstrated in my paper, Tough on Crime on the State's Dime, usage of the state prison system in California is, by and large, not explained by violent crime. It only explains 3% of the variance in county prison usage. So over the period I studied, for example, Alameda County and San Bernardino County had almost identical populations and almost identical part one and part two crime rates, part one being violent, part two being property and other crimes. But San Bernardino sent twice as many people to prison each year and had three to four times as many people in prison each year. They were sending more people to prison for longer to deal with the same crime problem. The state was paying for that prison usage, and Alameda, if it chose to deal with crime problems through mental health treatment or substance use disorder treatment, was paying for it out of county funds. Unless we have strong evidence that San Bernardino is right, we should not subsidize its choices. This isn't necessarily, and I just wanna point out, this isn't necessarily because of some underlying difference between San Bernardino's crime and Alameda's crime. But there's really no way to distinguish between reasoned discretion and policy choices or bias masquerading as discretion. We can't tell what's going on because there's no normal charge for a given set of behavior. There are choices. There's no real offense. You can characterize an offense in a variety of different penal code statutes. And there's no real sentence for the underlying conduct. Should this person get parole? Should that person get prison? Should that person get jail time? And I'm happy to talk further about why this is so. So my proposal is to give block grants to counties to deal with their reported rates of violent crime, and they can decide how to treat it. The reason I pick reported violent crime, we care the most about it. We could also be responsive to crime waves. And most importantly, politicians don't have an incentive to inflate those numbers because they're political poison. And we could include other factors if we'd like for reasons I can explain in the Q&A, like poverty you know, levels and things like that. But the theory would be that counties could use this however they wanted. If someone in Kern County has one theory and someone in Marin has another, we can put that to the test. You can use it on prisons if you choose to allocate your money for that, but you could also use it on other things like treatment and prevention. Crucially though, if you ran out of money, you would need to raise that money locally. And this takes these value and policy choices seriously. If you want to incarcerate, you should put your money where your mouth is. But right now, carceral counties put someone else's money where their mouth is. There's personal responsibility built into the criminal legal system when it comes to people who break the law, but not for local decision makers who choose how to enforce it. So given that so much of the system is already local, the role for the state would be to inspect local systems and enforce standards. We want to avoid the shame, as we did in the plot uh, litigation, of admitting that we were in violation of the Eighth Amendment for years while the case made its way to the Supreme Court. And I think we might also want to subsidize alternatives to the system, what I like to call non-entry, to contrast it with re-entry how to make sure people don't get in the system in the first place before we start to put give them treatment and various programming. Finally, in my written testimony, I pointed out that if we have prison and jail beds, we will use them. 
But I want to ask why these are mandatory and beds for the unhoused are optional, or why our childhood poverty rate is somehow not a public safety issue that isn't also mandatory in the way that building prisons and jails are. So we could consider penalties for a county's ratio of jail beds to treatment beds, with the goal being that jail beds are reserved only for the necessary cases, not to treat mental illness, substance use disorder, or homelessness. I don't have the time to discuss resetting baseline defaults or reorienting the system to where it is difficult to deprive someone of liberty rather than difficult to give someone their liberty, but I'm happy to talk about that now in the Q&A. Thanks very much. All right. Thank you all. This is really interesting stuff. Um, so I have a couple of questions for everybody. Um, first are Oos. Oos? Is that a, getting it close? Um, yep, that's right. Was there something, I'm just asking, I'm interested in the just the sort of history of the juvenile realignment. What are we calling that? Is it juvenile realignment? I've, I've heard juvenile different- Juvenile realignment, yeah. Juvenile, excuse me? Realignment, yes. All right. And perhaps Senator Skinner or others might be able to weigh in here. Um, can you give us some historical background about why we went? I mean, that was a pretty dramatic shift, right? From zero to, to uh, you pay for 100%. Um, what prompted that and, um, do you think that some of its success was that it was um, limited to a specific um, population? Do yeah, you know? so that's a great question. And uh, so first to, to start with a clarification, it was up to 100%. So um, more serious crimes got, got more of a subsidy um, than less serious crimes with the idea that, you know, perhaps uh, you want to provide more uh, financial support to counties for more for incarceration for more serious crimes than less serious crimes or um, revocations. Um, but I understand you, the financial incentives, though, are much stronger. Yes. Compared to 678. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, and so here, you know, I do want to say this was 1996, so definitely not a time when there were conversations about scaling back, uh, uh, you know, the criminal justice, broadly speaking, or even juvenile justice. Uh, my understanding is that this was a, a fiscally, a, a fiscal responsibility policy um, with a backdrop of, uh, you know, so, some, um, some scandals around how CYA was operated, but really the idea was, why are we incarcerating, why are we paying for incarceration um, when the, uh, when counties could take care of these uh, young people uh, themselves? So that's my understanding. It was really meant to be um, a realignment, you know, a, a realigning incentives. And I think this was really the first effort to try to directly um, internalize costs. One thing that one thing that's interesting to me relative to uh, more recent iterations of these kinds of efforts um, is that it didn't really come with uh, much, with many other changes at the same time. So legislation beyond this, uh, this cost internalization didn't change. There weren't efforts really to target particular crimes uh, or just specify what offenses could or couldn't uh, land a person in prison or in jail. It was really focused on just um, the financial lever. And I think you ask, would the same thing happen if there was an adult version of realignment? Is that where you're heading at. Um, Perhaps, and I think- or, or, Yeah, I mean, is, what, is part of its success that it targeted a specific type of case, let's say? Yeah, so I think it's possible that you know people think about uh, about young people. So this was juvenile, so people thought about young people as being more willing uh, to take a chance. Although I think that more recent efforts, even though again they didn't operate only through the financial channel, uh, suggest that people are willing, you know, among other things for fiscal reasons, to reduce the scale of incarceration when faced with this cost internalization. But I think it's plausible that what you know what you're describing that um, because with young people um, um, there were, people were more willing to um, uh, to you know to substitute to, to less stringent punishments. And if I heard you correctly, you said that this had been try attempted some version of this has been attempted in other scenarios. I've heard of six seventy eight. I understand the realignment, which I think is a little bit less clear policy this way. Are there other jurisdictions even outside the U.S. that have tried? Yeah. Like this. So yeah. not that, you know, one thing I'll say is um, I think, you know, I, I don't want to say it's the only only uh, country, but I think it is a little bit, uh, you know, at least 
not the case, the case all over that there is this uh, disconnect. So for example, you know, I'm from France originally, I'm in France right now, and here there isn't this disconnect between um, costs and benefits. Everything is done at the, you know, at the equivalent of the federal level. Um, to your question, so I end up asking questions about would drawing attention to costs be sufficient um, relative to uh, something like, you know, just having counties internalized costs. There is one experiment so um, uh, that I know of, which was uh, in Philadelphia, where um, D.A. Krasner, one of his, uh, when he was elected, one of his measures was to ask uh, prosecutors to state out loud how much it would cost to uh, implement different sentences. Um, so it's a little bit similar in the sense that, you know, there, there, there was an internalization, but at least there was saliency of these costs that was brought forefront. Um, I don't I think it was possible to evaluate uh, this approach because lots of things changed when he came into office. And uh, I'm, I'm not sure how well implementation was done. So I don't know if this was actually happening. It wasn't really documented whether prosecutors were in there, you know, in, uh, when bringing up different um, plea offers or when arguing at sentencing, whether they were bringing up uh, the question of cost. But at least this was uh, that I know of an effort to try and draw attention to the cost dimension. And other than that experiment in Philadelphia, we, do we know of anything else? I am not sure, but I'm happy to know if other people have heard of this. This is no, the one example not. that comes I, I to mind. And we've looked into it and we haven't found any yeah. obvious examples. Uh, David, do you want to jump in here? Yeah, I just wanted to point out that, you know, this importance of studying whether or not, you know, these policies work via data. Uh, so when I was in law school in 2006 and taking a class with Joan Peter Celia, we had the then director of the Department of Juvenile Justice for the state of California, 450, you know, million dollar organization. And one student said when we were talking about juvenile justice realignment, we said, um, well, so how has this worked? And the response we got to a law school class was, oh, I don't know, maybe someone should study that. And so one of my, the pair of my classmates actually did a study about how that was effect. I mean, it was you know not published and it was not at the standard of uh, Professor Us's paper, but I just found that incredible that we spend all this money on things. And that's an afterthought to think about like, how will we know if this works and what are the data? So it, it had almost, it, it, it was, you know, I won't say the person's name, but it was almost as though it had never occurred to her uh, that this was something that we did this massive change. And then she's like, oh, law students, why don't you do this? And they did. Of course, we, you know, we we deal with this all the time. And it's something that, you know, this committee, I think, is, was founded in part to try to make as many decisions um, based on data as possible. Obviously, it's really um, baby stages in terms of even in the areas that have the best data, it's pretty, I think, rudimentary in criminal legal system in general. Forget about this. So uh, that's, you know, one of our overall missions of this committee is to try to lift up some of those ideas and base more policies on real data, not just being evidence-based, but being really evidence-driven or whatever the next step is. Mia, do you know of any other examples in, in California or elsewhere besides juvenile realignment 678, and then I'll throw in realignment too? No, I, I don't know of other examples, but of course, I'm happy to look. I think it is, as Professor U said, largely based on sort of the structure of our system, that this is even a, a possibility. One thing that we might consider, too, is like unified correction systems do operate in some ways with, you know, at least within the system, allocating, you know, so this is Alaska, Maine, places like that, where there's a unified system of all you know, jails and prisons and probation, et cetera, et cetera. And so those are typically in states with populations uh, of less than a million. Uh, but that's a sort of soup to nuts way of accounting for, you know, cost to the system. You could conceivably, at least in theory, say, oh, well, we're having a prison overcrowding issue. Let's release, you know, the people who are, you know, least dangerous out into the streets. Um, so that might be something to consider. And I just want to add that, like, Missouri also did a similar thing to uh, what Professor Oost described, um, you know, D.A. Krasner asking where judges would know, you know, sort of, here's what the going rate is for this, you know, crime, and this is how much it costs. Right. I remember. Has anybody studied the Missouri project? To your knowledge. I I read about it somewhere. I can, I can, let me see if I can All find right. it. So. All right. So, Mike, I, I will I... say... 
Sorry, Sorry go ahead. No, go, go ahead. I was just going to add that there were some uh, experiments, but they were more, you know, um, uh, lab experiments, uh, uh, one of which I participated in, but there were all others as well that tried to see like, hypothetically, if I give people this information, will their decisions change? Or hypothetically, if people had to pay the full cost versus a fraction of the cost, would their decision change? And they found that at least hypothetically, the answer was yes there as well. And I can point you to those um, papers as well. Tom, what were you gonna say? I was gonna say, uh... You know, there are two other examples um, that, you know, we didn't include one of these because it was from the 60s and the 70s in our memo, but there was something called the Probation Subsidy Act where the state paid, uh, California, you know, local agencies to put folks on probation. It was ended, I think, by uh, Governor Brown the first time around, right around the time the determinate sentencing law came into effect, but by all accounts was a big success. And then the other book and more recently, the law that went into effect this year in the incompetency to stand trial context that is going to cap how many um state hospital admissions counties can do and and um, has the possibility they'd have to pay to go beyond a, a baseline. So it's got a great pedigree. Well, great. It's got a pedigree in California. I won't weigh in on whether it's great or not, these sort of ideas. And it's something we continue to use, uh, including last year. Um, so it's sort of a, a California special, I think. Um, other committee members, please feel free to jump in, but I'm going to ask this to all three of you. Um, Michael so we, Wolf and Richard Rosenfeld are two people who've studied uh, the Missouri system. So right. I remember reading some of those. So, if we were to, and I'm, I'm also curious, uh, Senator Skinner, particularly your perspective, you know, given your budget and public safety perspective on how you think these incentive programs might fly in California. But we've been talking about it today, at least in the context of plea bargains. Um, and dismissals of charging decisions. Obviously, I think it could be applied in a million different contexts. I was wondering, based on the experience of data and things that you've thought about, how where would an effective way to implement an incentive program in California, if you were to thought of an area that you thought would be particularly um, right for this kind of intervention? Where 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 might you look? And Senator Skinner, do you want to jump in before? Um, well, the when we're talking about the youth one, that uh, or first version in the '90s, uh, the there were scandals at CYA, the CYA. I don't think we yet had the court order um, on them. I, I mean, the conditions were so terrible, and the uh, the lack of uh, medical, mental health, and other treatment for those youth that were in the state facilities. It was really more than embarrassing. Um, so once we, so I don't know what the price per youth was at that point, but by the time I got elected, which was 2009, we were spending over 250000 per youth in a state facility. Um, which is an absurd amount of money. We're talking 2009 at the point of the peak of the recession. Um, and while we had that realignment, which would give you know counties obviously um, some motivation, and just like in our previous panel, or maybe it was today's panel, I'm sorry for getting a little mixed up, uh, it was disproportionate what counties sent the youth to, yeah, it was today's, what county sent our youth to state facilities versus which uh, supported them in county county programs or community-based programs. And that was the case up until just uh, the two years ago when we completely dismantled the uh, state uh, youth authority, got rid of the, what, you know, we're just closing them now and are putting the burden on the counties. But even up to two years ago, it was disproportionate by county. But anyway, back to that. Um, so even when the price, when the cost to us was that high, uh, what we had was the youth were being sentenced to indeterminate sentences, and those indeterminate sentences, the uh, guards at the facilities, the staff at the facilities, were able to do time ads as the punishment. So what the indeterminate sentence did was just gave you a time when you could first go before considered for um, parole or probation, and the uh, staff were able to extend that so you wouldn't even have a shot at going before the parole or probation. And part of that was they could see the writing on the wall. They could see that 
with the incentives to the counties, the direction was to reduce that population set. So it was a job preservation action by those staff. So we in the budget, in uh, it took a, it was a huge fight, but we finally, I think it was 2011. Can't remember. We got it in the budget to eliminate those time ads, and within three years of the elimination of the time ads, that population had dropped in half. In half. Now, of course, we changed it entirely. Now, back to your key point: would would we be able to um, look? Logic says we should do something like that. That there should be that. Look, county, you want to because some you know some counties don't want to build a new jail, what have you. So it's like, all right, county. You want to put the burden on the state? Fine, you pay for it. Uh, other counties will will pay you. Um, however, that what happens is you have this. Uh, the urban counties will, and we see it up and down the state. The more urban suburban counties will take responsibility for both uh, both adult and youth by and large. They just send less people to either you know. And the more rural counties will not. And uh, uh, while the political makeup of the legislature is such, you could think you could say, "Oh well, we should be able to pull that off." It it's a it would be very very difficult. Mike, um, I don't know, Assembly Senator Skinner, are you done? I didn't. Yeah. Yeah, so I want to say just a couple of sort of framing, you know, points. So one is that I think it's important not to base any sort of funding or, you know, um, uh, rationing on per capita decisions, right? So I live in Santa Clara County, and we send few, we have fewer no new felon admissions than uh, the state average. But once you control for violent crime, we're actually sending way more people than we probably should. So I think that our metric for determining uh, how we ration is really going to be crucial. I don't think it should be population. We could include things like poverty, although the present system doesn't do that. We could include population of, you know, young men aged 18 to 36. We could, you know, do a variety of other things, but there has to be some kind of theory underlying that. And I and so I think that um, it, it's just misleading sometimes to say, well, you know, so San Francisco and Fresno, they have very similar populations. San Francisco has a much bigger crime problem, and yet it's fe new felon admissions for the period I studied was less than Fresno. So just, I, really I, just, I just wanted, David, before you get on, so you're just saying how we determine the baseline and whether or not we're charging counties. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, yeah, right. right. Yeah, and I think that- My understanding the way that 678 works, and perhaps is that we've looked at the past five years or whatever for that particular county, and if you go up from that- then you get charged. And if you go down from that, then you get a benefit. Yeah, but, but that sort of locks in people who've been, right. happy, you know, people eating at the buffet and they're like, great, I get to keep loading up three plates and you, you know, had a salad. And so you get stuck on salad. Like, I, I don't think that. If, I, you I do if you gave the benefits from, for not eating at the buffet any longer, I understand. No, listen, yeah. I understand there are ways to fine tune it. Well, he just, he's just recommending a different metric. So yeah. what the appropriate metric is, I don't know. And that alone would be, would have there would be great disagreement on what is right, the but that's why i think violent like people say that we we care most about violent crime right it's not something that politicians want to inflate and that's supposedly the reason why we need these really expensive carceral solutions is because somebody hurts somebody else and i'm just saying that that is why i think that really keying it off of that as opposed to we've been using it a lot to deal with property crimes or whatever. So, so I, that would be, I guess, what I'm, I guess what I'm trying to say is like, I understand that you can key it off of and baseline it off a bunch of, a bunch of different things. I'm just curious about whether or not we think that we can pull this kind of incentive program off at all, whether or not the theory of doing this is realistic, either, you know, in California, given our you know current climate based on whatever, let's assume that we pick the, the best, Go ahead. I'll just say one. I'll just say one. I mean, so I don't know if I it says that's I'm not a political scientist, but the, I, in just in terms of what would make a good policy, I'm trying to say that. Let me just say one other thing, though, then, you know, it used to be in the 1850s that like a third of the people got released from prison on parole. And I, I thought about this because Senator Skinner brought it up. 
And now we basically treat each individual as though there's some risk that they're going to turn out to be Charles Manson if we release them. I think what would make the most sense, as you said, you have to release 15% of people every year. You get to pick which 15%. That way, there's not this problem of like, well, Mike Romano is going to reoffend. You know, there's a one in 100 chance, but Mike is the one. And then Professor Us is the one. And then Professor Ball is, you know, like the, all of that. We don't, we don't actually, we end up where everybody has, you know, all 100 people have a one in 100 chance of, you know, of offending, right? And so if there's some kind of, you know, systematic thing where you're like, look, the average case is average. It's not, it's not extraordinary, right? Like, you know, the one in 100 really has to mean 99 people are not. And so I would say that those structures would also, you know, that's another, but anyway, I'll stop talking because- No, I, I, I think I get it. Um, so let's go with Mia, uh, Professor Oos, and then uh, Assembly Member Brian, unless you took your hand out on purpose. Thanks, Mike. I think everything Professor Ball was saying is important, but I wanted to respond kind of more directly to your initial question. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to think about incentives as a really effective strategy, broadly speaking, and then kind of two different ways of going about policy in this space. And the first is incentivizing things, things that we think would be really good for counties to do in the long run. And the second is things that will pay for themselves right away. And I think in the in the first camp, we could think about trying to incentivize diversion to behavioral health treatment across a wide set of offenses as something that would be really good to provide more incentives for and to begin tracking better at the county level and to provide you know, an influx of state funds to help support. But that is really, I think, a, more of a long run. We could look at some short run outcomes as indicators of success. Um, we can certainly look at the number of diversions, but I think that's more of a long term investment in terms of seeing the payoff down the line. In terms of those that kind of fund us back right away, fund the state back right away, I think there are a couple spaces to look in that are along the lines of SB 678 and realignment that are really thinking about relatively lower level offenders. So we're thinking about um, in one space, short stays in prison. So thinking about, you know, how is, does it really make sense from a cost benefit perspective to be sending people up to prison for really short stays? Is there a way we could incentivize systems that can manage an increase in their jail population to allow for those terms to be served in jail? There's certainly a cost differential there, some of which could go back to counties, you know, the extra, some of which could be held by the state potentially along the lines of SB 678. And then I think about, um, the way that we're treating the non-non-nons under realignment. So we're thinking about no matter when your prior offenses were, if you have priors that make you prison eligible, you go to prison. And we could think about incentivizing counties to retain folks in their local systems that would otherwise be eligible to go to prison just because of their priors. And that might be something that counties have flexibility in doing depending on how far in the past those priors are. Um, but we could think about a way in which that would have a similar structure, would generate savings that could be shared by counties and states. But I think long sentences- That's, similar. It's a, yeah. that's the same thing as the short sentences. I mean, it would be a lot of overlap there, the short there, terms. There would be a lot of overlap and you could go at it in either direction. Right, I get it. Um, and just to make sure I understand the two, what I see as two different ideas before we get to professors, um, is incentivizing treatment, especially for behavioral health services, so diversion, incentivizing diversion, um, and that that would, and you're saying that that wouldn't be a savings to the state because really where we would be we would be paying for that those diversion services. I mean, it might be a some savings because they wouldn't be sent to state prison, but we would be using that money to pay for robust services theoretically. I think you can think about a calculus where we're saving, we're only investing what we save, but I think it's a harder determination and it might take greater investment in the front end than what we yeah. save in the early years. Got it. Versus let's call it the short short prison stay population, which might include the non-non-nons or whatever, but you could you just cap it at one year at CDCR. That's obviously an expensive group of people. CDCR wasn't designed to hold people for one year. It's And I believe that you have a study, actually, the outcomes of people that stay locally for those for those uh, same crimes, even if they're held in county jail, are better than if they go to prison, right? So we're paying more, and we're getting worse outcomes for at least for that those short stay 
population. Is that right? Am I summarizing your work? Properly? Yeah, it's a little bit more specific to a couple, a few different offense types, but there is, I think, reasonable evidence that people do just as well or better when they're sent to prison for relatively short stays for fairly low level offenses. If versus keep- staying in versus staying in jail for the same offense. Jail or jail and probation or probation, these seem they seem to do just as well or better. Right. So basically among the various options that we have, prison is the worst for, for some low level offenses. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Okay. Right. Professor Us. Uh, so Mia already brought up a lot of the uh, points that I was going to raise, and I really, you know, want to plus one the point about looking at priors. I think the uh, general inclination is to say, let's look at your current offense uh, and see where this lands you. But the question of like how long your, um, you know, how long ago your priors were, if there is some margin to uh, uh, think about that, that would help, especially you know when one thinks about inequities and likelihoods of having accrued um, these priors in the first place. Um, so I did want to add this, not necessarily I. I think that the, the pension is more to think first about uh, the current events and the priors. I do want to, you know, talk again about um, the idea of um, just to, just to, yeah. just to pause there. We're talking mm-hmm. on giving. This is all on the idea of taking people who would ordinarily be spending their time in state prison and telling them they had to be um, housed locally, and then reimbursing the locals for some portion of the st- of the state savings. That's and right. We're talking and- about whether or not we're using it based on their priors or their current offense or the amount of time that they have in CDCR. Those are all exactly. different ways to measure. Got exactly. It. So this was your question, like, who would you prioritize? I think this is another, you know, margin that could be that, uh, you know, of course, you'd want to know how many people would be on these different margins. Uh, but that is one thing that I think would be interesting to explore. Um, then the other thing I wanted to say is this idea of um, raising, just raising the costs of different options. So maybe this is something that is very well known. I actually am not sure. I think it's not something that people think about a lot. And so going back to a point um, that David made earlier, which is, um, you know, there this is something that I think would a uh, uh, address the question of costs. Uh, sorry, yeah, of like this could, I don't know if it would work. And I'd be curious, I think this is something that could be evaluated actually more easily than um, other other policies. But I don't know if it's the case that um, different uh, legal actors know how much the different options cost and really maybe seeing the numbers in front of them um, would change their decision making. So this is something I do want to, you know, we kind of talked about and this could uh, address the points that um, uh, Senator Skinner was was raising of, you know, it's it's hard to when you ask people to bear more costs, but perhaps there isn't this trade off as directly lowering the time that a person spends in prison or, uh, you know, yeah, just, I don't know exactly what the margins would be, but raising these different costs, having people pay attention to them is something I want to re-up at this stage. We don't know if it works, but I think it's definitely something that I would uh, like to know if it works, because if it does, that seems like perhaps an easier avenue to um, explore both in California, but in other states as well. Cool. David? So I just want to say uh, a couple of different things. So one is that you could look at wobblers and you could say, all right, you know, state average of wobblers is X amount felonies, Y amount um, misdemeanors. And, you know, their average cases should be average. Right. And you can say, yeah, let's, you know, let's tweak wobblers. That seems it's a there are a lot of them. Uh, and they make up a lot of sentences, that would be something I think that is pretty doable by you all. Um, I want to say, you know, a couple of other things. So just, one, wait, just to yeah. pause. So you're saying make more wobblers? No, no, no. I'm saying look at a county's, you know, charging of wobblers as felonies and county chargers that charges wobblers as misdemeanors and say, you know, you got to do it that the average case is average. And, you know, if you're accounting that's doing 70% felonies, you know, on, you could subdivide it, but, you know, just. But then, I don't know if that changes much, right? Because most wobbler cases end up staying in state, in county jail anyway. I mean, in terms yeah, of. But then we get into, but, you know, if you have a felony on your, you know, as a prior, right, that ties into what Mia and. Uh, sure, or, but so you're saying that you pay counties. To keep to stay to the uh, to keep the average, or well, actually, what I would say is all the most of the stuff about salience is cost, right? That's why they say it's going to cost you an extra dime to get a uh, you know a grocery bag rather than you save ten cents. 
So yep. you charge if you go over that, right? Uh -huh. And that's another sort of policy design thing. But I mm -hmm. want to say two other things about policy design and then one other policy suggestion. So I will say that short stays in prison, like parole revocation, we never kept track of that, but like 10,000 people a month were going back to prison for three months or you know a year or something like that on parole revocation back in the early aughts. So you know that whole notion that prison has never had short stays, like they did used to have some short stays. It was just done you know, under, you know, constructive, different kind of constructive legal authority. And then the other thing that I want to say is that all the information that I've seen, or most of the studies, and, you know, Mia and Orly, you can correct me if I'm wrong here, is that justice reinvestment didn't really work in terms of shrinking the system. It made it maybe more efficient and it made it fairer. And so I think if we're talking about reallocating money that's currently spent, on the criminal legal system at a local level, it can't be controlled by the prosecutors, it can't be controlled by the sheriffs, it can't be controlled by law enforcement because it's just going to go into expanding their, you know, their reach into other areas, right? It really has to go somewhere else. And again, I appreciate, you know, the importance of saying once someone has entered the system, let's treat them better. But I really do think we need to focus on non-entry because, again, as everyone is familiar on this call, like even a short stint in jail is really going to screw you up, particularly if you're poor, you have an at-will job, you know, somebody posted money to pay your bail, et cetera, et cetera. No, I hear you. I just like right. just two more things, right? So, so one way to do that would be to say, hey, here's what it's costing the family members of this person that you're detaining pretrial, for example, right? So let's actually count all of the costs to individuals in addition to the system, rather than just like, this is what it's going to cost us to, you know, incarcerate somebody. And by the way, a lot of those savings, we don't realize until we shut down institutions because the marginal cost of a prisoner is different than the average cost of a prisoner. Right. Okay. I'm going to stop you there because I did have that, that I want to get to that. Point. Okay. So first of all, to your first point, Mia, I thought that I read from one of your presentations that actually the investments in the 678 context did result in better services at the county level. Yeah, I mean, by as best we can tell, we did see sort of a shift in the orientation of probation departments from sort of an enforcement to more case management. And we saw an increase in the use of evidence-based practices. So and by evidence-based practices, you mean services? Get people assessed for risks and needs, getting them programming in alignment with their assessments, their assessed needs. Got it. JRI right. is a federal program, so I wasn't talking about 678, but. No, I know, I was just curious. And then this is, but the question about the marginal cost of, like we're saying, let's talk about the short prison stay idea for a second. Um, and perhaps Senator Skinner, this is something that, so you, you could say that we, each prisoner costs an extraordinarily amount, large amount of money, and therefore, we have a bunch of money to divvy up between the county and the, and the state in the savings of somebody not going to state prison. But the marginal cost is, is pretty small, right? And is, is it going to be a strong enough incentive that we give counties a portion of the marginal cost savings of one person? Is that, is that a strong enough incentive? I was wondering if anybody had thought about that. I don't think so. I mean, even to Professor Ball's point about shutting down institutions, we are still not realizing the kind of cost savings we would have expected in our efforts to close down institutions because there are still folks working um, in the in the system who have been replaced and put in different spaces. And so I think this is a quite a bit to unpack in terms of incentivizing counties and from what resources out of existing infrastructure or new pots of money. I also just wanted to raise the the question about um, Dr. Ball raised uh, thoughts about comparative groups between counties. This is the county average. The average is the average. And I'm wondering, in, in that kind of line of thinking, that's what counties are weighted then as well? So that, or is it, right? So would Los Angeles and a smaller county, if Los Angeles has a lower average and significantly more people, is that weighted in such a way to reflect that? Um, those kinds of yeah, questions. I mean, so, you know, what I did, you know, in this, uh, study tough on crime on the state's dime was sort of I looked at you know the rate of violent the ratio of violent crime to new felon admissions right and so you have 
So that explains the sort of Alameda San Bernardino comparison. They actually were remarkably identical for the period that I studied for 10 years. And you can see, wow, every all of the sort of ex main explanatory variables, right? There could be others that I didn't think of, of course, but crime rates, population, population 18 to 60, you know, eight, whatever the AG's cutoff is, maybe it's 65. Right. And you can see, like, wow, there's something different going on here, right? That it's that that um that we wouldn't expect necessarily to see. You know, I mean, Los Angeles is its own place. And I don't even know if Los Angeles, like the county is sufficient, right? Because if you talk to people there, it's like, well, the West side, you know, like the, the going rate is this downtown, the going rate is that, you know, in the Valley, and especially in the rural parts of Los Angeles County, the going rate is something else, right? And we just don't have any transparency about that. But one of the reasons I think for talking about what our metric is before we design these policies is that it could reveal things that are sort of covered over right now in the average. So I just talked about how LA County average really is accounting for like lots and lots of different local practices because there are 13 million people there. But if you look at the sort of statewide average of California, right, it might not make sense to divide it up. It might make more sense to be like, wow, we actually have a, you know, a Redding problem. We have a Merced problem. We don't have like a county problem because we have these, uh, we don't have a statewide problem. We have a Fresno problem, you know? Um, so, so those are the things that I would just encourage you to think about so that we have, so we're making sure that the diagnostic data that we're getting, you know, like our temperature rising, that it's actually correlated with the things that we want to talk about, which is why I think you control for crime, because that's not a hard sell. Like who should go to prison? I think most people would agree that if anyone should go to prison, it's people who hurt other people, right? You had in the Kowalczyk, you know, case that's coming up, that's going to be an important bail case, judge in San Mateo County for a guy who tried to, you know, buy a hamburger worth seven bucks uh, with three credit cards saying like, well, you know, the people of San Mateo are not going to feel safe, you know, if they own property. And I'm like, mm, I don't think so. Not not in order to keep this guy in jail for nine for six months and charge him seventy five thousand dollars bail. Right. So that's, again, why I started the framework with what is our theory? Like, who is prison for? I don't know that we can answer this question about how much prison to use unless we have an idea of like who is prison for under what conditions does prison make the most sense and not think about sort of shrinking expressly saying our system needs to be smaller because the opportunity costs of the money we're spending are not actually giving us much bang for the buck. So I'm curious about to hear uh, Mia and Orly's response to Assemblymember Brian's concern that we won't have, a, that the financial incentive won't be strong enough to actually have the effect that we're hoping well, to have. I, I want to raise another issue. Go that ahead. is okay so financial incentives one could argue are quite logical where's the studies that they work in this kind of setting well I, studies I are from the 678 context context in the juvenile that's the result what i meant is as an incentive not as a after the fact yes we we know we could probably and best definitely based on the studies design such a measure in a way that actually achieved some savings or, but does this concept as logical as it is actually work as an incentive is what I really am trying to raise. It's well, like I guess a happy guess, discussion, if, but. I, I understand. I mean, I, me and Orly, if you could address that, my understanding was that that was the design of 678 and the juvenile justice realignment. Well, was... it was the design, but was that really, okay, so Michael, everything's politics and but more than just, po and I don't mean that in a way of just how you get a legislative vote. I mean that in terms of all the whole ecosystem of it, the counties, the, so often the, and Isaac can, often the, the factual or the, the messaging framing argument that we use while there is a basis of uh, fact and truth for it and can be a motivation for some people. It is not, it is what we are saying when the real motivation may be somewhere else or. I guess Orly and Mia, can you guys, or? Well, I had a comment. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I think, I don't know if you were getting at this, uh, Nancy, but you know, it is political. You know, when you compare Riverside County with San Bernardino County and say San Mateo with Kern County, Fresno County, the DAs 
the population in those counties and we just have kind of a different uh, attitude and all these metrics may not mean a darn thing to them when they're going to be hard on crime and right. other counties like LA or Santa Barbara even well, Alameda County may have a different perspective and saving money may not be what it's all about precisely but we've had these two pretty big experiments yeah. that's what I want to hear about what's but it goes back to what 19 19- 96? Yes. For, I mean, I think, if that, anything, 1996 was a time when, you know, people were even tougher on crime. You know, it was, so I, just, just to read this this one point, um, and if I may, I, I understand um, the point of, you never really know why people are doing things. Well, uh, but, I, yeah, yeah. I wasn't making that point. I was making the point that the reason that we say may be very different. For example, the reason that the, the the most recent realignment motivation that was done um, in wasn't juvenile, but was done mm-hmm. for yeah. uh, low level crime to put yeah. Yeah, in yeah. county jails. Well, yeah, that saved money because clearly we spend a lot more per person in the state facility than we do in the county jail. But the complete motivation was we had a court uh, ruling hanging over our head. That was the motivation. So yeah, of that course. could have been yeah. 96 also. I don't really yep. know. But yep. my point uh, is there's many times the actual reason or the overwhelming what reason is different than what is articulated. No, I, I, I think that's entirely true. Let me just mm-hmm. try to set the stage here for a second. And I think, and this is why I kind of hedged on realignment to begin with. With me, I remember I was like, I'm not sure if this really. Yeah. 678 is act, was like sort of purely, if I'm not mistaken, an incentive-based program not that long ago that had a pretty dramatic impact, right? We said that there were too many probation violators in state prison, right? It was way too high a number. We wanted to reduce that number as a matter of public policy. And the way that we did that, is we said, probation offices, if you reduce the number of people who you are violating, we'll give you more money for these type of evidence-based pro- projects. It had a pretty dramatic effect and it wasn't terribly long ago. So, all that being said, I don't. I wanted to get back to Assemblymember Brian's point that there isn't that much. How much money do you, or how how strong does the incentive need to be in order to have an effect? Do you think? Can I speak to that, May? Yes, okay. please. So I think I I do think the actual incent the strength of the incentives as reflected through the amount of additional revenue that counties might get is important. It there has to be a there there, but I think. Sometimes we neglect the importance of state leadership. So when you establish goals, you establish objectives for counties, you provide support and incentives to meet those objectives, you create a culture of achievement, I think, and alignment from counties with counties and the state. And you draw people into these agencies that are interested in improvement, that are interested in pursuing the goals that the state has in mind and want to work at the county level to achieve those goals. So I think there, it's more than just how much more money will the county get if it succeeds. It creates an alignment, a conceptual alignment, it creates leadership, and it creates kind of an, an environment of improvement that I think brings a lot of staff into these jobs that otherwise wouldn't be in them and really changes the culture of county criminal legal systems. Hmm. So I just want to emphasize that, not to ignore your point, but to add that to it. And I would add that like the CCPs after AB 109, I mean, were I think at least originally designed to do some of this like local policy making, bringing everyone to the table thing. But what I wanna reemphasize here, having just you know finished up on the alternatives to incarceration task force in Santa Clara County, is that it is really important not to just let system actors make these decisions. I mean, again, we're talking, let's not talk only within the system. There's a boundary in between the system and the rest of society. And, you know, I think we need to say, like, how does the criminal legal system fit in with our other goals and other things we could be spending our money on, right? And the Justice Reinvestment Initiative point that I made was that, you know, that reinvestment, this is a federal program, didn't happen because the administrators were all within the system. It would be like asking a law professor to shrink the law school. Like, I'm gonna think of ways to make my law school better, 
but I'm not going to say like my law school shouldn't exist. And maybe we actually need voices that say, yeah, we should, you know, have the law school invest more money in the education department or in a local high school or something like that. I wanted to get to Orly because I wanted her to respond to the, how strong the incentive needs to be. And then assembly member Brian, and we're running sort of, we're, gonna, we're running a little bit over, but so Orly, yeah. could you go first? Yeah, I'm going to give um, uh, two answers first. I think, I think honestly, we don't know the answer. Like, I don't know what the exact dollar amount is. To be honest, when I studied the juvenile realignment, I didn't really know how the numbers came up, how they came up with the numbers because of the question of marginal versus average costs. Right. And so I, and this and is where did, you- And what did the number, was it a marginal cost or was it an average cost? How much did they charge? I couldn't that? really tell, honestly, how the numbers came up. This is not something that was- well documented. Uh, the to me the co the costs were um, it was hard for me to tell. They were probably somewhere in the middle. They were neither the they were neither the marginal nor the average cost. There was I a don't concrete know. number. There was a definite number. Yes, yes. There were there were they were fee. There was a, a sliding scale basically depending on the offense a person uh, committed, which is interesting. Which tells me that it's neither nor because you know incarcerating uh, a person who's who's charged with a who's convicted of a low level versus a high level crime the cost is the same um so anyways this is so yeah the 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 the, the scale is something that i'm sure came from uh, lots of discussions so this is something that i don't know where the and i understand that you know i'm going to raise one thing which is uh you know the cost is something we already talked about the cost savings come when uh prisons close and of course there are uh, other you know there are jobs uh, attached to a prisons closing and this is where i don't know how close or far California is towards considering the question of um, uh, closing prisons. Um, but that is something that I don't know if this would be a realistic thing to, to raise as well. And then I do want to bring up again, like here we're talking about the cost of running the prisons, um, but then perhaps there's a way to also include uh, the cost, you know, as David was saying, to families, but also to individuals themselves of being in the system. So kind of having a more expansive uh, definition of what the cost, the cost to society are of incarcerating people or of different penal policies more broadly, in addition to, you know, you know, I think I think that the current marginal costs of incarceration are ridiculously low. Something like ten dollars a day is, I think, what the numbers, at least to that the most recent numbers I saw. So, you know, to answer your question, no, I don't think ten dollars a day is something like that's a rounding error. If that, um, so uh, you know, it, it, either a combination of more expansive definitions of costs working towards you know things that would more dramatically yeah. shrink the size, yeah. I, I get prison. it. I mean, it'd be it'd be interesting to go and excavate six seventy eight as well. Obviously, no prisons cl closed around six seventy eight, um, but there's st we still managed to get um, money to go to um, them. That's well. right. Um, but yeah. uh, suddenly, member Brian. No, I think I think that's my fear with this line of thinking as, as an incentive for for change, which I, I it's definitely worthy of discussion. But my fear is that the cost savings have not been realized at the state level, um, but we have made these commitments to fund local infrastructure or incentivize changes in local infrastructure. And when I say local infrastructure, I mean like AB 109 money is sitting in the sheriff's departments, right? Uh, because that's who runs the jails, right? And so we we just passed a billion dollars more in, in pay raises for corrections officers or some sort of incentives just this year. Um, not with my support, but the 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 growth is is still happening at the state level while we're increasing our commitments to funding the carceral system at the local level. And so that's my concern with with these trade-offs. I think the incentive idea is is righteous if the cost savings are real and you're actually reinvesting that to try to encourage new behavior at the local level that that saves us money. But I don't think that's fully what we've seen in practice. I think we've just, in incentivized even changes in behavior, but at an additional cost to the state, not at a cost savings. But, but is it is it isn't it okay? I mean, I'm not in charge of the budget, so it's easy for me to say. But is it okay that we say that uh, fewer, better outcomes, right? Fewer, fewer people behind bars, fewer victims, better public safety, and even if there is no savings, like isn't that what the state's supposed to invest in? I think I think to some degree, if if you are also taking the, you know, responsibility for the impact of these robust billion dollar law enforcement agencies. Uh, oh no, I'm trying to I'm trying to are, reduce I'm trying to reduce those 
those billion dollar trust me on, on well, that. I mean, not, not, not at, at the state level yes but if if the incentive is dollars locally and let um, particularly if it's as professor ball mentioned every county kind of do what you think would have an impact on violent crime you are going to see dollars going into probation departments into not all of them are going to go into odr structures and the sure. department in la county even though they might ought to right and well that's 678 had some limits on where the money could go Right. It did go to probation departments. Right. Which is, you know, carceral department, you know, certainly a lot of people see it that way, but it did have to go to specific programs. Um, so like you could you could imagine, you know, some, something like that. And I just wanted to say one of the super the benefits here that I think that and this gets back to Mia, your article that you talked to us about in one of our original um meetings and i'm going to focus on the short stays in prison is not only are they very expensive not only um are they not what cdcr is designed to do um but they get worse outcomes it's it's we're paying the most and we have the we have worse outcomes so to your point assembly member brian yeah the marginal cost of having 10,000 people less in cdcr may not be a tremendous amount of money, but we should pay if it's if that's what it takes to get better outcomes. I mean, I think that that's what we should be going towards. OK, let me let me try to wrap all this up orally then David, and then let's try to come to a close because we're already uh, running over. this. Running over is kind of a yeah. good sign because it you, shows that we have uh, some you know robust discussion and interesting things to talk about. On the other hand, I want to try to respect everybody's time. Of course. So, I. I just wanted to clarify one thing, which is, you know, um, uh, there's one way to think about this is will costs overall go down? And then the, uh, and I think here, you know, there's a lot of reasons to think, well, actually, the answer is probably no um, uh, for all the reasons you already raised. But another one is to say, will it change the decisions that are made? So, you know, you can have the version of I'm going to lower costs and also reinvest in other in, uh, you know, respend this money. I'm. I just want to uh, uh, raise the point that you don't necessarily need that. You could raise the costs of prison and you can have raised the cost of prison and also increase budgets locally. Uh, but at least in its earlier iteration, this was not the case. So, you know, yes, it wouldn't lead to cost savings necessarily, but it's not necessary that these policies of raising attention to the cost of incarceration or having cost internalization would necessarily lead to more cost, not necessarily less, but not, not necessarily more. So that's a point I wanted to clarify. Got it. David? I just wanted to say there are ways of, you know, changing the salience of all these things, right? Like you all, there's there's lots of ways of making politics to say, hey, in Fresno, 15% of your money goes to these things and they're this expensive and, you know, yada, yada, yada. Whereas, you know, a neighboring county, you know, spends 10% of their, you know, and look at the outcomes that they get. Like there are ways of making people understand you know, maybe you say, here's a tax bill for the state of California. And of this, look, you know, a whopping, you know, 20% is going to fund the state prisons. Like there are ways of raising consciousness, you know, in terms of various behavioral nudges that you could do that would make people understand, oh, we are doing these things. Because the, the level of ignorance about, you know, the criminal legal system cannot be understated here in terms right. of what actually goes on. And so I think data and I think, you know, sort of, publishing that kind of stuff like that's what i hope the bscc would do it's not but there certainly is scope for doing that all right um well thank you one of the things that we try to balance here and what i try to keep us focused on what's the best policy as opposed to how how to sell think politics i know that they're not you know they're impossible to sever completely but i really want to try to keep us focused on you know what we think would be the most effective policy and then we'll leave it to some member brian and senator skinner to decide how to make it actual politics. Um, that's why they get paid the big bucks. All right. So I'd like to take a five minute, uh, ten, let's call it 10 minute break to 2.20 uh, to come back to talk about what we discussed today, follow up on prior uh, recommendations and uh, some other staff presentations. So uh, 2.20. Thank you all. Thank you for joining Thanks. us. All right. Thanks. Bye. Bye.